So a big welcome to you all and to our Chile In Focus event this evening. I'm Jane Andre, a member of the local Stamford and Rutland Amnesty Group who are organising this event tonight. Thank you so much for taking time out to join us this evening, particularly as you've chosen to be here with us rather than at your local pub or some other recently allowed activity. Um, you being here tonight shows support for our local Stamford and Rutland Amnesty Group and very importantly for support uh, for our social justice and human rights. Tonight's event is part of the Amnesty International UK Central England Festival of Social Justice which has involved some 50 plus free events taking place between the 16th of April up until the 31st of May. The, uh, the, the Festival of Social Justice brings together the 40 local amnesty groups in the region and a range of wonderful and valued community organisations. It's really a celebration of people making a difference for a freer, fairer and more compassionate society, aiming to spread the word about social justice, human rights and to encourage people to take action. That is a legacy, a legacy from the Pinochet regime. So one of the things that we're going to mention later on is the case of Gustavo Gatica, for example, which is an active case for Amnesty International UK, which was a student who was protesting and he was blinded because the police officers uh, in, in, in attempt to stop the mobilizations they were just shooting at people but they were using harmful ammunition and they were shooting people straight to the upper body. That means your chest, your head. And he was blinded, but he could have been killed easily. So um, that's another side of what we're going to be discussing today. Um, I would like to invite to the floor now to Jorge, who's also going to be joining us tonight as a panelist. Hi, Jorge. How are you? Hi, uh, Carla. I'm, I'm, I'm all right. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. So um, I was wondering if you can share with us uh, what's your connection to Chile? What brings you to to be here tonight? Well, I I, I think I said in, in the introduction about that. Um, it happened that uh, September 11, we should have a different meaning for our, uh, Chileans, which is not the same as September 11 that happened in New York. Um, we didn't know that somewhere in Washington they were uh, planning, which is called, uh, you know, uh, Oper Operation Condor, where uh, uh, intervention from different countries in South America, um, Argentina, one of them, and uh, on that day uh, the CIA uh, was supporting uh, the generals in Chile, and um, they. Uh, uh, they were going to the presidential palace in Santiago, in La Moneda, 1973, overthrowing uh, President Salvador Allende, who uh, died that day. Um, that day I was uh, going to school, I was in primary school, and I grew up in Los Rillos, in Santiago, which means uh, small hills, and I, I used to live near the REF. And that day, I could hear uh, the air fighters, um, helicopters, the gunfire, and the smoke coming from the city center. Um, a few days later, uh, um, two of my cousins, who were studied at the University Universidad Técnica del Estado, uh, they had to hide amongst uh, friends and family because um, many students from that university were um, detained and they were killed over there. Um, during that the same period, some of our neighbors were taken by the soldiers and they were sent to uh, the National Stadium, which is quite equivalent to Wembley here in London. In London. Um, and over there, uh, they were uh, taken uh, prisoners, they were interrogated, and they, they were uh, tortured. And when they, they come back, they never were the same again, and the sense of community uh, where I used to live vanish, no more uh, solidarity, nothing. Um, we were quite lucky because my dad, he was working in a factory, and he was a member of the union, he was on the blacklist, and fortunately he wasn't uh, taken 
by the soldiers. I remember that uh, we had to burn any any literature that they have any liberal content. Um, that's my memories about that. Um, uh, no far away, I'm, uh, I'm talking with, with, with my mother about that, and, and I found out that uh, I witnessed uh, the bodies of some young men that were uh, killed near my the, where, the place where they live, and I don't remember anything at all because I, it being so a blackout that it was so traumatic, I really don't remember. There are so many cases and histories. I, I think I've been quite the, the lucky one that I have the opportunity to to talk about that now. Thank you, Jorge, that's really interesting. Yeah. One of the things I actually was thinking while I was listening to you is that we talk about transition to democracy, but um, we haven't covered how actually that happened. And we know there was a plebiscite in 1984 and some demonstrations across Chile against Pinochet started to, 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 to take place, sorry. So I was wondering maybe if you can share with us um, your experience regarding the demonstrations against Pinochet, you know, the ones that took place in 1984 and onwards. Well, it, it, time, time passed as uh, people started to uh, not to have the same fear they used to uh, be uh, along the country and about 1984 the first demonstration started um, um i decided to uh, join a political party it was called Is Is izquierda cristiana and the same part political party have a section that called unidad pluralista camilo torres and uh, where it was mainly a uh, wall uh, graffiti and with some friends from the Catholic Church, uh, we decided to go at night and to throw away pamphlets, uh, leaflets, uh, to paint walls and to uh, throw some nails on the street to pierce uh, military uh, vehicles. Um, then people started to organize and uh, making some noises in, in the houses we call Cacerolazo and shouting Iba Caer, which is, uh, he's going to fall. Um, I also, uh, I was quite naughty in some sense because I, I, uh, I, I, I was getting some tires and put a one on the street to, some, to make some barricades. Um, and then uh, when I was at university, there were quite a lot of demonstrations. Um, I remember once, uh, one uh, student who was a musician uh, playing piano, he was uh, shot in her head by the, a policeman, and I was a few yards from uh, over there. Uh, the regime uh, used anything to, you know, intimidate. Um, once I, when I arrived home, my parents, they thought I was a ghost, and I found out that uh, somebody called them saying that I, I, was, I, was, uh, I was dead. Um, um really this is something i can say about my experience thank you and um, one of the things i think is, is really interesting is to see how that uh resistance and social movement actually built up from 1984 onwards and then we had the plebiscite in 1988 which actually sealed the lack of Pinochet. so maybe you can share with us your role during the plebiscite or anything you would like to share with the audience as well about that yeah, um, Mr. Pinochet, um, uh, he was unhappy about being in power, and he decided that um, after getting a new constitution, which is something uh, Carol is going to talk about that, he, he wanted to stay eight more years in power. And I think that he was sure that he, 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 he would win about the, this plebiscite. He was in 1980. Uh, eight, I think. Um, then uh, there were two options. One was uh, yes, see, and the other one was uh, no. And it was quite a massive uh, campaign. The the slogan for them was, if you vote, uh, you know, yes, we are going we are going back to the same that happened during uh, Pinochet. It said it was fear. And if you say no, uh, I mean, if, sorry, uh, if you say yes, we are going to offer you stability and all the things happen with the neoliberal economy in Chile. Um, Pinochet lost by 56% uh, of the vote. 
And, and because we were very suspicious about Pinochet, I decided to uh, be a witness during the day of the vote. Um, and then I, it was over there when I, far, I, I realized that uh, the far right people, they have a lot of resources and money. I remember that they have a very posh uh, pack lunch. And I just just carry my uh, sandwich made from my from my mom. Um, if somebody want to know more about that, there is a quite famous film called El No. Uh, El No have a slogan about a rainbow, like in the NHS now about with COVID nineteen. People have hope these things uh, will change, um, and, and some promises about that. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, that uh, didn't happen. And and this is why the something happened in October uh, 2019, but at least uh, we got a new presidential uh, person, uh, Patricio, Patricio Elwin, who was elected. Um, and then uh, the, it, it came, a lot of stuff happened after that, hope, and and, and, and we thought that everything was, was going to be all right, but it wasn't. Thank you Jorge, for that. It is really interesting because we can start seeing how actually social movements in Chile started to define, you know, their coming years of, of what's going to be happening even after transition to democracy. So I think the transition to democracy itself and the plebiscites and the campaigns actually opened the door for a lot of people to start protesting and actually pushing forward a lot of reformations in Chile that they wouldn't stop in 1990. They, they'd actually carry out until present time. And now we're seeing Chile is trying to redraft its constitution, which at the same time, that constitution or the present constitution of Chile is a legacy from Pinochet because he had a lot to do about that. But I was actually wondering if um, Carol will be able to join us because I think it will be really important to the audience to understand what happened in 2019 because we can see like the history is repeating itself in Chile and maybe you can tell us what has what, what is the estashido and what happened during 2019 in Chile. Hello thank you so the estallido um, translated well I've never found the direct translation really um, social outburst uprising insurrection um, apparently a trivial matter, um, 30 pesos does not sound like a lot, but it was just the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, and the new generation of students were the ones to lead because they are fearless. Um, <laughs> they're incredible. Um, so this, this thing happened because Chile was a pressure cooker waiting to erupt. There was frustration with the cost of living Chile is an extremely expensive place. You go there on holiday and you come back bankrupt. I mean, you, you, you know, a cup of coffee costs the same as it does in London. Um, there are very low wages. Uh, Chileans have been forced into uh, this pension system, which is really unfair. They basically take your money at the end of the month and gamble it on the stock markets and only the administrators of the pensions, you know, uh, reap the rewards. But the pensioners can live off sometimes even 100 pounds a month um, so you have an impoverished old, old um, ancient population aging population um, there were no um, education rights a, a very poor public health system so this all of this um, leads to crippling inequality to add to this we have all of the injustices that were never really addressed so you have uh, a police uh, machinery that has never been taken to trial. So you have persistent impunity, you know, everyday repression, um, and then this, um, this, you know, suffocating inequality. Co college tuition fees in Chile are among the highest in the world, and it's thought that up to 70% of the average Chilean's income goes to pay their debt. Um, now, it's a bit baffling because, you know, it's a country that is considered wealthy, but it is one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, the richest 1% of citizens in Chile earn a third of the national wealth. And if you think that the, the average wage in Chile is about 400 British pounds a month <laughs> and a rent in Santiago is 300 pounds a month, how on earth do they live? They can't live anymore. Um, there was also uh, a lot of anger about the political classes. You know, there was a lot of fanfare about Michelle Bachelet. You know, she's a socialist. She's a feminist. She was an exile. She came into power and did 
nothing but deepen the neoliberal model uh, and she did nothing but continue to repress the indigenous communities and the working class so it, it became people became more and more divorced from the state and less and less enchanted with this whole process because there wasn't a real transition to democracy you know people were rubbing shoulders with their torturers you know torturers would give be given would be were being given top jobs um you know in the factories so you know you have this hotbed of impunity um and and so political crisis um took place because people had had enough so the saying became it's not 30 pesos it's 30 years referring to the fact that it's 30 years of lies of a transition to a democracy that never came and it's interesting that jorge should mention the film no because you know the film is made by la rain who happens to be the son of one of Pinochet's cabinet ministers, um, which is also strange for me as an observer to note that the narrative is being shaped by those and the, the sons of those that carried out these heinous atrocities. Um, so the protests um, start to attract more and more people. First, you have the students, then the students are being ill-treated. There's, there's um, talk of torture uh, and then groups start um, coming onto the streets to support them, feminists, anti-AFP people, you know, all sorts of grassroots movements, and it becomes this like huge event. Um, we have um, demonstrations with up to one million people. I mean, if you consider that Chile's whole population is 19 million and you have one million people marching in Santiago, that's huge. So this, these reasons, the lingering impunity, the everyday violence uh, of inequality, um, and also access, you know, young people have access to information. They can see how other people are living. They're saying, hang on a minute, we don't, we, we don't want to live like this. Um, so that's really what kicks off the whole thing. It's really um, important something that you mentioned. So, for example, you mentioned how people were living with perpetrators. So if somebody tortured you and you managed to escape a detention center, because there weren't actually any trials for perpetrators after the dictatorship, so people who have committed human rights violations or atrocities, you can run into them in the supermarket. They were just living their lives as civilians and they were just there. And maybe victims will have to go all over that again. And I think that's interesting because it brings across the question of how a culture of impunity is actually present in the Chilean police forces and in Chile's government as well. So I think it would be really important maybe if you can tell us um, how these human rights abuses that we saw during the process in 2019 took place, if you could give us an insight of what was, what's actually happening, because you mentioned participation of students, um, and we know that 40 people were at least killed during 2019. That's right. So, um, what happens is that on around, I think it was the 20th of October, uh, Sebastian Pineda declares this state of emergency and he brings out that doctrine that you were talking about so prevalent in the, the Latin American countries, the enemy within. And he said something along the lines of, you know, we are dealing with a very serious, dangerous enemy. Um, therefore, you know, he filled the tanks, uh, the streets with tanks. So you have the tanks, rolling onto the streets just like 1973 it was very traumatic for the older generations who had already lived through that and a lot of people couldn't really believe it was happening again i remember like you know waking up on the 20th of october and all these horrendous uh videos being sent to me of people being thrown out of uh, the back of trucks you know unconscious um the military you know just fights just firing into gardens um, it was absolutely horrendous. So we have this state of emergency being declared, tanks filling the streets, and like you mentioned, 40 people being killed. I mean, one of the most emblematic cases, in, in my opinion, well, that they're all emblematic and they're all horrendous, but um, Daniela Carrasco was a mine, and she was found um, hung off a fence, strangled, tortured, raped, and beaten. Um, that case has never been um, investigated and it just seems to have been buried, you know, among the uh, all the recent events. Um, and then we have um, the police. Um, now, the Chilean police and army 
are very fortunate. Ten percent of the copper profits go to financing them. They have state-of-the-art equipment, um, and it's quite baffling. You know, they have better equipment than soldiers here did to go to Afghanistan, uh, and they use this on the people, on students, on indigenous people, on working-class people. And what they started to do was actually this illegal thing, which was shooting protesters above the naval, uh, and this results in 427 eye injuries that we know of that have been recorded. Um, in Cambridge, I was fortunate or unfortunate, I'm not sure, I met Michelle Bachelet. She came to have a talk at Cambridge University. I called her directly and I asked her, you know, what was going on and, and would she say something about it? And she did actually say that it was uh, an abuse of human rights, but she didn't go much further than that. Um, we know it goes against uh, international convention. Um, and then you mentioned Gustavo Gatica. We also met um, a chap called Matias Orellana, who lost an eye. He came to London um, in 2020 and gave a, um, a talk. It was really interesting. But it, it didn't stop there. You know, not only has Matias Orellana lost an eye, he's been picked on because he came to England to give a tour. So he's arrested every time he goes to the supermarket. His family are hassled. Um, the, the case that he's trying to bring against the perpetrators of this crime is being stopped. You know, it's just a constant um, targeting of activists. Um, apart from violence in the streets, we have uh, the criminalization of protests, which Reynaldo will talk about, um, which is happening to the Mapuche community. You know, protest is seen as a criminal terrorist act. Um, we have around 1,600 people still in detention today. We have political prisoners in Chile, um, and we have two types of political prisoners, historical ones that have been there since the 90s, and we have Mapuche political prisoners because their, their claim to ancestral uh, rights has been criminalized, and then you have the new generation of uh, protesters from the Estallido, um, and it's thought that um, there were 28,000 people detained, you know, in two months. That's a lot of people. Um, and we have about 8,500 allegations of human rights abuses, but these are only the ones that have been counted. You know, that we, we don't really know what's going on because we can't trust the government and we can't trust certain uh, human rights um, institutions because unfortunately they've been staffed by by those in power. So, you know, it's very difficult to get proper figures. Um, so it's 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 a harrowing situation because, you know, Pineda said, Sebastian Pineda said, in Chile there are no political prisoners, which then deprives those prisoners of their rights as political prisoners. Um, so at the moment we've got around 2,000 people detained in the context of the social uprising, and loads of these are minors. They have no criminal background and the state, the state is actually seeking um, maximum penalties. Um, according to Chile's penal ombudsman, 4,080 minors were arrested um, in 2019, and 186 of those have been detained um, in prison. So it, it, it's, it's a really bad situation because prison is being used as a deterrent to protest. Yeah, I think it is really serious. Uh, one of the things I, I was actually thinking about, um, because this actually happened two years ago, and I think it shows a trend if the people during the 70s and during the dictatorship of Pinochet were being targeted as enemies of the state because they were spreading communism. And today they have activists and human rights uh, advocates and people who work in, in, in the field of human rights. Uh, or people who just want to exercise their, their right to protest, they are actually being targeted again by national forces if they try to express themselves, as we saw in 2019. So the situation was quite severe and, and quite concerning two years ago. And now with the pandemic, we've seen not only in Chile, we've seen across the world how the right to protest has been jeopardized by many, many governments. So how has this, the human rights situation in Chile changed since the pandemic? Well, it hasn't. I mean, you know, the only way for things to get better in Chile is to remove the influence of Pinochet. I mean, Pinochet is everywhere you look. The shadow of that, that man, that monster, is everywhere you look. And it's embedded in the security law. 
So the law for the internal um, state, which was created in 1984, penalizes with prison those who destroy or disable means of transportation. Uh, so if you stop a bus, you can be arrested. It also says that anyone who incites or induces uh, subversion of public order, anyone who meets, arranges or facilitates meetings. So political meetings have been outlawed um, because it's considered to be conspiring against the government. Anyone who propagates in word or in writing can be arrested. Um, and to make things worse, as if the 1984 LES security law wasn't bad enough, Pineda then brings in new laws in 2020. The barricade, the anti-barricade uh, law, which disappointingly uh, some members that call themselves left wing and are touting themselves as left wing within the constitution voted for. So the anti-barricade law means that anyone who obstructs tra uh, traffic can go to prison with a really high penalty or anyone who hides their face. So the anti-hood law, which now is a little bit difficult to enforce because we're in, in a pandemic. So, you know, obviously everyone's going around with face masks. But um, the government so far has actually filed lawsuits against a thousand protesters using this uh, the state security law, which is actually not in line with the international human rights law. They're breaking laws left, right and centre. Now, repression during the pandemic um, has been a little bit more subtle because it's not in the centre where all the photographers are and where all the media is. It's gone to the shanty towns. So now they've started to target soup kitchens. Um, now, traditionally, in, in the working class suburbs, uh, women used to get together in workshops and do the, the famous Apieda stitches, you know, workshops to, you know, the, the, the families have disappeared to narrate their stories and also um, soup kitchens because there was a need, a lack of food. You know, it was a terrible time in the 80s, but that has happened again with the pandemic because the government has failed to provide a furlough scheme. Uh, Chileans are being forced to draw out their pensions to be able to survive. And nobody's talking about any other option. It's like there's no there's no options. No one said, where's the furlough scheme? Even the left are just going along with, oh, let's get our, our other 10%, which is crazy. Um, so there's no financial support. People have been forced back to the sort of soup kitchens. And then the, the security, the state security, sees these soup, soup kitchens as sites of political organisations and starts to target them. Um, I was working with one particular soup kitchen in a, quite a very, a very emblematic area called Villa Francia, a stronghold of, um, of struggle against the repression. Um, and the people there have been constantly targeted. They have drones um, over the población. There are tanks on every street corner. Um, there, there have been arrests. A lot of this is anecdotal. Obviously, I can't back it up because this is the, the things that are told to me. But I know of people being arrested, being dragged into vans, being beaten up and told if this was during the uh, dictatorship, you'd be dead or calling them effing communists and stuff. So there's a constant climate of fear, of intimidation, of following of civilians, uh, plainclothes civilians, um, following people. Uh, also, numerous students that have been going on their way home after protests have been shot. I interviewed a boy that was, he's around 21 or 22, who lives in Santiago, who on his way home from a protest going back to Puente Alto, uh, was fired at in his legs, shot uh, on his way back from a protest. So uh, it's, it's more subtle because it's happening uh, sort of in, in quieter neighborhoods. Um, and we've heard other disturbing things like um, a couple of young men being found hanged, you know, in their in prison cells. Um, a young immigrant man was beaten to death by two policemen and thrown into the street like garbage. Um, and this is because, you know, the police force, the Navy, the Air Force, the four pillars of the Junta have never been challenged. They've been allowed to remain intact because Pinochet said, the day that one of my men is touched, the rule of law ends. And that was practically written into the Constitution. So, you know, we have a legalized impunity in Chile, and that's why the constitution is it, it's so important to remove it and challenge it. Thank you, Carol. Yes, I think this week is going to be really important. I mean, if, if anybody wants to keep up with the successes in Chile, uh, because after the process in 2019, one of the things that happened is that the government held a referendum and asked Chilean citizens and their people if they wanted to re redraft their constitution, because the constitution has a lot of um, 
Pinochet um, footprints, to put it in a way. And one of the things that Carol is actually talking about is really important because the question is, so now there is a referendum and there's going to be another referendum to redraft the constitution, but who is actually going to be in charge of redrafting that constitution? It's also another question and it's really interesting. Uh, it could be any of the political factions in Chile, but I think this is something that you're probably going to be able to see this week during the news and, and see what happens. But this is actually an outcome from the process in 2019, the idea of reforming the constitution. It's an opportunity. Now we'll see if it's actually going to be something positive or if it's going to push Chile even further. Um, because Chile has a lot of open discussions at the moment, not only with the right to protest, but also with minorities and other groups. Uh, a lot of conflicts, especially things that have increased during the pandemic, as a lot of things across the world, but especially in Chile. And because Reynaldo is actually here with us tonight, I thought it was a good opportunity to ask which is the situation of the Mapuche community in Chile at the moment. As many of you know, there are indigenous communities in South America, Mapuches are present in Argentina and in Chile, and they are challenging the government in order to get land recognition. Now, Carol was mentioning something really interesting in how things have changed during the pandemic in terms of human rights. So the pandemic has added layers in a way of, of, of challenges for organizations, activists, and people who actually want a different Chile, a different country. So because Reynaldo is here with us tonight, I think it would be a really good opportunity to hear a bit of his history. Um, and what is the situation of the Mapuche community in Chile at the moment? Hi, Reynaldo, welcome. Hello. Uh, first of all, I will uh, introduce myself. Uh, I am... Uh, an indigenous Mapuche from southern Chile. I came to the United Kingdom in 1976 as refugee from the Pinochet regime in Chile. I spent two years in exile in Argentina, but following the military coup there, I had to leave from there as well. I settled here in Bristol and I did a number of educational vocational courses and work in various jobs. I used my free time to publicize the Mapuche human rights situation. And I do, now that I am retired, I do that full time. Um, as well as being fun, funding uh, member of Mapuche International Link, I am a member of Mapuche Human Rights Commission and Aupis Estela. This last organization has consultative status at the Economic and Social Council of the United Nations which allowed us to make oral and written presentation to the Human Rights Council. Um, uh, first of all, I will provide our overview of the history of the Mapuche because the current Mapuche struggle is closely linked with that history. The Mapuche are indigenous nation loca located in southern part of Chile and Argentina. We call our territory Walmapu. We are the only indigenous nation to achieve independence from Spain during the period of colonial expansion that took place from the end to the end of the 15th century into the early 19th centuries. Our nation was formally recognized in a bilateral uh, treaty in 1641, and uh, the border remained in place through to the end of the Spanish colonial era in South America. The border remained in place for 75 years after the declaration of independence from Spain by Chile and Argentina in 1810. The first constitution established by Chile and Argentina after their independence established the territory as the lands inherited from Spain and included all territory south of the established border with the Mapuche. The extent of each country's jurisdiction was reaffirmed in two treaties between Chile and Argentina and further treaties signed by both states directly with the Mapuche. I want to emphasize that the Mapuche have all the credentials of a national state 
because their people share the same ethnic origin, culture, linguistic, and spiritual bond together with a shared geographical location. They also were literally a sovereign state after the signing of the Pijin Treaty in 1641, a state with their own political organization, laws, and full, full control of its own affairs. Despite all of this, at the end of the 19th century, the state of Chile and Argentina illegally occupied the independent Mapuche nation and now appropriated the wall of their ancestral homeland in an attack which the Chilean referred of Araucanian pacification and in Argentina, the campaign of the desert. Uh, those uh, who survived the military attack were driven from their homes and uh, many thousands starved to death. In Argentina, many were hard, uh, herded into concentration camp, their animals stolen, their homes and crops burned. Children were forcibly removed from their families and many young people and adults were forced to work as a slave in plantation or as domestic servant for wealthy land owner. Others were forced to join the armed forces uh, or to work in mines or simply roam the land uh, in an attempt to escape persecution and death. Despite the Mapuche being an independent sovereign nation, Chile and Argentina invoke the doctrine of discovery, which uh, granting the European nation the right to occupy and explode barbarian lands, as they call it. The, the statement of former Argentinian president, Faustino Sarmiento, is typical of a colonial attitude at the time. Before the occupation of Walmapo, he st uh, stated, their extermination is provi providential and useful sublime and great, they must be exterminated without even sparing the children who already have the instinctive hatred of civilized man. Mapuche International Link and Auspice Stella together with the Mapuche Human Rights Commission denounced the militarization of the Mapuche ancestral territory, raised excessive violent repression, arbitrary detention, and murder of Mapuche land right defender. Uh, we can have a photograph which show uh, that uh, just part or very little about what uh, happened at this moment. The existing conflict between the Mapuche and the Chilean and Argentinian state derives from the present day illegal military occupation of Mapuche territory. This aggressive policy violated existing treaties uh, with respect of, uh, without respect for international human rights, territorial and customary Mapuche rights. Poverty is a fundamental problem affecting Mapuche community today, which derives explicitly from the legacy of colonial confiscation of our ancestral territory and natural, and natural resources. Impoverishment of uh, indigenous population was one of the prime uh, methods utilized by both states to subjugate the Mapuche into submission, depend, dependent society that could be controlled, a, situa a situation which remained for nearly 140 years. In addition to the defense of our cultural identity, language, environment, way of life, and spirituality, the focus of our fundamental struggle remained that uh, of the recovery of our ancestral territory, autonomy, and self-determination of which we have been deprived, the struggle for which has been criminalized. The authorities of both countries refused to recognize the Mapuche struggle as political, and those who fight peacefully to achieve those aims are arbitrarily incarcerated, accused of terrorism, 
and common criminality, while those detained are denied due process, process and recognition as political prisoner in contravention of the right enshrined in international standard and legislation ratified by Chile and Argentina, such as ILO Convention 169 and the, and the indigenous, um, uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the International Covenant uh, on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Um, the vilification of Chilean by Chilean authority and the national media of the democratic Mapuche social movement as a source of domestic uh, terrorism has been endemic, despite the fact that following the 2013 visit to Chile by the United Nations Special Rapporteur, his report affirmed that anti-terrorist law should not apply against Mapuche activists an organization to demand the restitution of their ancestral land. Finally, Mapuche International Link strategy in part with the aim to make visible internationally the Mapuche struggle for freedom. We have uh, presenting the uh, gathering testimonies and information of affected Mapuche community, which will constitute a detailed document in the underpinned by the principle enshrined in the Rome Statute of, uh, international, of the International Criminal Court. In particular, Articles 6 and 7 related to genocide and crimes against humanity. In recent decades, systematic uh, assault, assault uh, uh, against Mapuche leader and communities demand restitution of their territory, uh, who, who were demanding uh, restitution of their, uh, their territory, have been, uh, have been exacerbated by the excess, uh, excessive incursion of the militarized police and armed and paramilitary group act, uh, acting with total impunity. In addition, the Mapuche face institutionalized racism and discrimination from individuals, uh, organization and public and private institution to which the media is not exempt. The Chilean government meanwhile, uh, far from condemning or prohibiting such a uh, prejudice and inequality in vision of uh, the International Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, do nothing. In the current climate of the global Black Lives Matter movement, we are compiling information and testimony of uh, anti Mapuche racism and discrimination, which will include a list of, a list of individuals in public uh, position and government officials who openly promoted um, a state denial of fundamental Mapuche human rights has induced a, clim a climate of violence which threatened the, and undermined the peace, stability, and security of the Mapuche and non-indigenous Chilean citizens and has it through deeply embedded in the history foundation of the state. That is my Thank contribution. You. Thank you. <laughs> I, am, I am more than happy to ask and uh, reply any question if I can to by the people that are join us and, and anybody that want to do it. Of course. Thank you so much, Reynaldo. That was amazing. I think um, we have managed to like, have a completely overview of what's happening in Chile. We have been able to discuss its history and current event, um, and I'm sure the audience is going to have some questions. Uh, so now, actually, it's a good time to ask any questions to our panelists. So I'm going to give, I'm going to welcome to the floor to Jane. She's going to join us again. 
Um, and this is actually the time if you want to ask any questions to our panelists, um, that's the perfect opportunity for you to do so. Um, and I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight as well and for letting me be part of this amazing event. Stanford Group has been amazing uh, and I do encourage you to keep checking the lineup for the festival. Uh, so yes, I'm going to hand over to Jane now. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. So thanks to Carla and uh, to all our guest panelists. That was um, it was really interesting to get a wide insight into um, the situation in Chile, um, and um, I found it particularly helpful to get the historical context of what's happening today, how the legacy from the Pinochet regime uh, is impacting what's happening now, and obviously uh, with the uh, Mapuche situation as well. Rinaldo, to, to hear that history about the culture and how long that oppression has, has been going on for. So, so thanks for that. So yeah, we're now going to um, look at some questions from the audience. Let's have a look. So we have a question here. Um, and I think I will give this one to um, Carol. Um, so this is when Chile moved to a democracy, was it the same people in the police and armies that ran and populated those institutions and the same with the civil servants? Sadly, yes. Um, so you have figures like Rodolfo Stange, or Stange, I don't know how you pronounce it, but he was very prominent until well into the 90s and 2000. Um, Pinochet himself was the head of the army um, until he became senator for life. And that was only stripped from him when uh, after the Pinochet case. Um, so yeah, you had the same people running those institutions that were running it during the Pinochet regime. That's the short answer. Mm, okay, thank you for that. Um, and um, so another question we have is, um, do you think that the rewriting of the constitution will make changes for the better in Chile? Um, I'm not sure. Should I put that one to Carol as well? Um, sure. Um, now, it's a, it, obviously, it's very interesting. Um, and, you know, we had uh, a surprising result. But only 42% of the electorate voted. It was a very low turnout. So there's a narrative at the moment, you know, oh, you know, oh, Pinochet's gone. No, he hasn't gone. Uh, um, of course, the far right did not win their third that they would have needed to obstruct any radical changes. But what has actually happened is that we have 155 people constituting a body. Um, some of them may not be from the hard right, but they are from the political classes that the Chileans and the indigenous communities don't trust. Um, we have 17 indigenous uh, members, but you know, I think right now they'll be better off answering this one. You know, do the indigenous Mapuche communities really want to appear to a state that you know that they want to become autonomous from? So, um, although it's an interesting time, and I and and yes, the constitution must be written. Any change is going to be very hard one because you have such a disparate group of people pushing and pulling for different things, a low voter turnout, it's going to be very interesting. We do know that that constitution does need to be removed, but the person who wrote this constitution was very clever and um, the devil will be in the detail. We need constitutional experts to write this constitution. And that's what worries me. Yes, there are grassroots people there. There are a few feminists in there, but can do they have the skills to write a proper constitution that will redress the balance? I'm not so sure. So, you know, and also when Chile has undergone radical changes, then the international community uh, starts applying pressure like we had during the Agenda year. So already, whilst there's the, some in the liberal press, we have, oh, you know, in a shape, bye bye. Well, you know, that'll be, that'll, that's going to be very difficult. And then we have the right wing press saying, oh, you know, the stock markets are plummeting. So already we're starting to see traces of what happened in the 70s you know, re-emerging, and I think that we need to be very, very cautious. So, you know, while I am heartened 
by this. I'm not fully convinced, and I think that it's going to be a very difficult uh, next few years, um, tricky, and we're dealing with very tricky customers. You know, these are people that have all of the wealth in a very wealthy country. They're not going to just relinquish their power and, and their riches, are they? So I'm slightly more cynical than a few other commentators might be. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. Um, um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, I, yep. I think from my point, from my point of view, I, I have hope that things can change. I'm not expecting things are going to change dramatically, but I mean, some positive aspect about now is about all the 155 that they are going to write the constitution. Half of them are women. And I really, uh, I, I can put my, my heart to the Chilean women over there. Uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, people that are going to be over there are independents and are quite progressive. Um, and the uh, people from the establishment, the political parties are quite minority. And also the, the ethnic minorities are going to take part. And I, 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 I hope things are going to change for, for the better. Um, I, 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 like Carol, I, I can't, you know, said it's going to be a, a significant change because we can see now the international uh, countries are, you know, talking about the, the dollar and the, uh, uh, you know, the inversion that are not going to Chile because that is, uh, is, is happening. But um, I'm, I think things can, can change for, for the better and I have hope. Thank you. Well, let's hope so indeed, uh, Jorge. Um, uh, so I've got another question here. Um, from the point of view of those opposed to the right wing junta, to what extent can the USA be blamed for what happened in the 19, in 1973 and the legacy of Pinochet? Uh, Jorge, shall I give that one to you? I, I mean, it's very clear that uh, the American government on the times so, of uh, Nixon and Ford, they started to be very unhappy about some countries that they were to make some changes. Um, again, they were talking about uh, nationalized, for example, the, the copper and the main investment in that countries are from multi multinationals. So that I think they were the main uh, brains that they wanted to destabilize a few countries in South America and not all in South America. I mean, from my point of view, uh, 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 around the world. Thank you, Jorge. And uh, Carol, do you have any comments on that one as well? Um, so there, there's lots of documentation to suggest that the United States were clearly involved in the coup. Not only did they finance with uh, military uh, weaponry, they were part of a smear campaign. Um, Nixon spent $10 million prior to uh, Agenda's election smearing him in the local press in Chile. So there were uh, dirty tactics and there were overt tactics. Um, sadly, those files have not been declassified, but yes, there is uh, a complete complicity. And not just with the United States, we're talking about the multinational, uh, we're talking about multinationals and that involves the international community because you know let's not forget Britain's role in all of these things as well you know Britain was not very happy uh, with Agenda winning the elections either and then during the 80s uh, and 90s with Thatcher and Pinochet you know there was a lot of complicity going on there so um, while the United States did lead the charge on destabilizing and getting rid or deposing of uh, Salvador Agenda uh, I'd say that the international community is also involved and, and multinational companies directly Yes. Mm. Interesting. Thank you. Um, a question for Ronaldo has come through. Um, were there many Mapuche refugees from Chile? And how did you end up in Bristol? Ronaldo? Okay, I'll move on. Um, sorry, did you hear that, Ronaldo? Yes, I hear. I hear you. Uh, the question. Um, 
Well, I think it was a small number of Mapuche that we leave uh, Chile. Uh, because I remember when we created the first organization here in the UK in 1978, uh, used to call Comité Exterior Mapuche. Uh, we campaigned for um, for the uh, freedom of Mapuche being in prison in Chile, and uh, very few Mapuche managed to or were given asylum in Europe. But we managed to organize ourselves, even though we were a small group of people, and we created this organization uh, and we campaigned for the for human rights. At the time, uh, many of our um, uh, Chilean refugees like us, uh, they were a bit confused because they knew very little about the history of the Mapuche. Uh, many they come from different parts of, the, of Chile and the history in Chile, the official history doesn't tell the truth about what happened uh, mm -hmm. with the Mapuche nation. And, uh, and so we, it was a bit of a problem within uh, some uh, <laughs> activists, uh, you know, from, uh, but in the end, I think we, uh, we managed to campaign for the removal of Pinochet in the uh, World International Campaign. Uh, it was part of a big campaign that we also won part. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Ronaldo. Um, I think um, we, we're getting to the uh, near the end of, of our webinar time here, and I just wanted to um, ask another question to to um, finish up with. Um, that's here. Um, what what action can be taken um, here in the UK to give any support to what's happening in Chile? Um, Carla, perhaps I can uh, give that one to you. Uh, yes, thank you, Jane. So uh, from Amnesty International, our local group, some of them are actually working in a campaign for Gustavo Gatica. He's a student and he was permanently blinded during the protest in 2019. So what we're actually demanding is for the national prosecutor to investigate the national police force in Chile, but not only the officer who shot Gustavo, who is in preventive prison, prison sorry, but the entire chain of command. So we understand that what happened, it was a political decision to respond to the process like that, to use harmful ammunition, as Carol was saying, um, and to use force to inflict pain and terror. So um, we're going to leave some information on the chat. For example, if you are keen on social media, you can send a tweet to the national prosecutor and just ask him to open an investigation. Um, I think that will be a good start. Thanks. OK, thank you, um, Carla. And uh, uh, Carol, do you have anything to add to that in terms of um, what people in the UK can do? Is there any actions? Through, um, if yeah. anyone wants to support um, the victims of the uh, of, of police brutality, I think the best um, organisation to support is Ojos de Chile. We have a very unfortunate situation um, at the moment where those people who were blinded and have suffered ocular damage are being turned away from the hospital, and the state is not following through with their promises. Now. You know, there's there's a huge military hospital, state of the art in Santiago. You know, the military should be they should be like being treated there, but instead they're being pushed to you know kind of public services which are really poor and funded. Um, so I think if if people um, want to make a political statement, then yes, please do um, tweet to La Fiscalia because this is an impunity problem. If they want to donate, I'd suggest they donate to Ojos de Chile. Okay. Great, lovely. Um, well, I'm I'm aware that we haven't had time to answer every question that's been sent through, um, but we need to um, finish off now. Um, so, just thank you to everybody that sent questions in. Thank you for your interest and engagement in the Q and A. Um, and we will be sending an email out to everybody that's attended, and there are some um, contact uh, details in there. So. Um, 
for those of you that haven't had your questions answered, you could perhaps send those through um, through some of those links. Um, thank you again to our guest panelists for joining us this, this evening um, and for their valuable contribution. And um, just like to say thank you again to Stanford Shoestring in part one for their wonderful film. Um, Big thanks also to our great behind the scenes support team, Harriet Wills and Anne McFarlane. Uh, no one can see or hear them, but they've been working hard as part of the team to bring you this webinar tonight. So thanks to them. And thank you again to our audience for choosing to join us tonight. Um, I just wanted to let you know that there are other festival events taking place locally and across the region during the rest of this week and next. You can find out more about these via the Amnesty's Central England webpage or for our local Stanford and Rutland events, you can go to the Stanford Arts Centre Watson page and look for the FOSJ event. So I mentioned that we'll be sending out an email tomorrow that everybody registered. Um, so there'll be some links to organisations we've mentioned tonight and some further sources of information on Chile including actions you can take um, and how you can donate if you'd like to support any of the causes mentioned. Um, and there's also a link to the YouTube channel where we'll be uploading a recording of the second part of this event. Um, there's also some recordings of some other great festival events and campaigns that have been taking place around the region. So do take a look and let your friends and contacts know. So that's it. We really hope you will join us at some of our festival events. Thank you so much for joining us again. And on behalf of us all, I wish you a very good night. Bye now. Mm -hmm.